नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस For very early on in the rehearsals, I was interpreting a scene, and Peter said, "Malika, keep your voice down because you sound like a shrew." And I said, "Peter, in India there are no shrews; there are only shaktis." And he didn't like that very much. <laughs> and then on, it was not only my role. I was arguing for Kunti. I was arguing for Gandhari. And I said to him at one stage, "I said, why did you not choose the Ramayana? You're a white male." Anglo-Saxon male, and if you want your women in a certain place, then you should have chosen the Ramayana. Why did you choose the Mahabharata? Dancer, actor, and public intellectual Malika Sarabhai writes a memorable account about how she stumbled her way to health, fitness, and sanity. In this episode of BIC Talks, Malika speaks to author and journalist Ramji Chandran about her book *In Free Fall*. which is all about coming to terms with yourself and your body and find the lifestyle that works for you how to make mistakes pick yourself up and carry on this conversation was part of the bangalore literature festival 2022 so i read her book in free fall my experiments with living in preparation for a podcast where she was my guest it's called the literary city and I had a wonderful time on that podcast with Malika and it's such a pleasure for me to be able to do this live with her today. When I was prepping for the podcast the first thing the title the title got me. You know forgive me for thinking that it's a downward spiral of a famous person you know in free fall. So I figured that okay it's one of those books but instead when I read that book what I got was a story of courage perseverance victory there are lots of adjectives but importantly a lot about common sense. and the reason i say that is because while she in the public eyes appears to have lived a charmed life and doing the most wonderful things ever she has actually had a number of crippling personal issues through which she built a career and a life not an ordinary life in other words she took charge of herself simply she found a way and she did this without putting the blame on her whole family right so as most biographies and memoirs do Her book takes you on this journey through one part of her life, her relationship with reclaiming her health. Let's start with a few things that characterize her life. So can I plunge in Malika? It's wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you very much. So first of all, you played Draupadi in Peter Brook's Mahabharata. Of all the people, they picked the right person to play that role. How did that come about? It was very strange actually. I had done a lot of amateur theater, but never professionally. I had done films. and in those days and i'm talking of 1983 84 we in ahmedabad were definitely b tier city right and always read in the times of india and in indian express what was happening in the rest of the a cities i was reading about peter brook and the production and his coming and pupul jaikar having selected 200 people wow. that he would audition of course in the big cities bombay delhi calcutta bangalore and madras and that peter wanted either krishna or draupadi as an indian because he felt those were the two uniquely indian characters and we read on and on and on and um, at the end of the month there was no announcement of who was going to play anything and i was pregnant and i had very bad hepatitis and i had been in bed for 4 months and i got a telegram in those days there were telegrams yes i got a telegram from the cultural attache of the french embassy one morning it was april 84 saying are you in ahmedabad because i want peter brook to come down to see you i was sort of very surprised and i was in ahmedabad because i was in bed so they arrived the next morning five of them jean claude carrier included and i was completely yellow very skinny with hair down till here and i thought they must have come to offer me some faltu role and they talked to me i had no french incidentally they talked to me for about 15 20 minutes and uh, then peter said we would like you to come and audition for draupadi and i nearly fell off my chair because draupadi has been a favorite character since i was about 5 years old and i panicked i was um, i had been married only 2 years bipin and i had started my publishing company mapin that right. very month and um, I didn't really want to do it but I did want to do it and all my friends said you know we would give an arm and a leg for a role with Peter Brook 
And I was flying to America. I auditioned with his assistant director at the Lincoln Center. And then at three in the morning arrived in Paris, was auditioned at 3.30 in the morning in his theater. It was a strange audition because he really played the Navarasa with me. He'd say, do this scene with Kichaka as a tragedy. Mm. Or do this scene as pathos. Or do this scene. And the person who I was auditioning with, it's a, it's a sort of three balcony theater. And he would run up and scream down at me from somewhere. And, but I was offered the role. And I panicked completely. And had it not been especially for Amma, I wouldn't have done it. Because I, we were just starting off on a career. I was going to have a baby. And he insisted on a two-year contract. And I thought, I can't do this for two years. But that's how I got the role. That's fascinating. But tell me, did you, uh, when you first encountered Peter Brook and you auditioned for the role and everything that followed, was there a tangible difference in the professionalism from what you had faced before this? Well, I had never faced professional theater. I had never faced international theater. Dance, yes, but theater never. So I didn't really know what to expect, except that every single actor across the world who was a friend thought he was, he was the messiah. And, you know, right. thought I was stupid to even question whether I wanted to do this role. And even though you were a newbie to the whole thing and you started to play the role, there was a point in which you had an issue with the interpretation of Draupadi, right? Now, it's quite the vogue right now for everyone to be writing novels about the women's perspective from the epics and so on. You did this decades ago, and you did this with none less than Peter Brook. Please tell us the story of that, that whole thing. What did you do and... Uh... Well, very early on in the rehearsals, I was interpreting a scene and Peter said, Malika, keep your voice down because you sound like a shrew. And I said, Peter, in India, there are no shrews, there are only shaktis. And he didn't like that very much. <laughs> and then on, it was not only my role, I was arguing for Kunti, I was arguing for Gandhari. And I said to him at one stage, I said, why did you not choose the Ramayana? You're a white male. Anglo-Saxon male, and if you want your women in a certain place, then you should have chosen the Ramayana. Why did you choose the Mahabharata? Mm -hmm. And then he did not want me to play the scene where I say, I will wash my hair in Dushasana's blood. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's too gory. And again, I said, Ramayana for you, Peter, Ramayana. But I have to say that through all those arguments, and Jean-Claude Carrier was my savior because I would go seething with anger, seething with disappointment, wanting to pack up and leave. And Jean-Claude would say, Malika, just relax. Just, just, just keep your arguments going. And he and was, he was on the day, it. On the day of our big opening at the Avignon Festival, that morning, Peter came and said, yes, I think you should do that scene. And when you, when you asked him, when you suggested to him that you were less than happy with doing a fairy tale version of the Mahabharata, his first response to you was dismissive, monosyllabic, you said. Yes, Peter was somebody who didn't like to be contradicted or questioned when he was with the other acolytes. And uh, if you went to him in his office and said, I think this interpretation needs looking at, he would agree. And then he would come and present it to the group as his point of view. Ah. And, and that for me was somewhat problematic because I'm a very impulsive person. When I think of something, I say it, and it gets me into a lot of trouble. But with Peter, I learned that. And I have to say that it was a two-year tumultuous relationship uh, before we settled down. And then at press conferences, Peter would have me sitting on the stage, and after a very nice session, he would say, and now if you want to hear my horrible sides, I present to you Malika Sarabhai. You know, one of the things is that you capitalized on whatever you did, but more than anything else, you have uh, been very uh, true to the arts, to the art form. And it occurs to me from everything I've seen and read is that you've not taken any shortcuts. You haven't pandered to clickbait. You've been an artist. What's with what's going on now? Do you suggest that people still hold themselves to an artistic standard? You know, when I was growing up, Amma was doing things like using Bharatanatyam to talk of Dalit atrocities. Using Bharatanatyam, which is a form of Shringara, to talk about dowry deaths in Saurashtra before the word dowry death was coined. And I thought all artists did that with their art, to be very rudely shocked. To find out when I became a professional that she was an exception. 
I think that remains so. There has been in recent years a lot of exploration by writers of suddenly rediscovering Draupadi and Sita and so on and so forth, and, and of dancers in choreographic styles. But in actual content, the work is still very much within the realms of Saugandha Lehri or uh, Krishna stories reinterpreted from a different side or finding another epic or finding another part of the Vedantic question. I think the need of artists or the gumption or gall of artists to actually use performance or writing or whatever. Writing is much more, but performance to talk about things that really concern them and that can get them into trouble is still unfortunately very far between. And I think that in the kind of situation we are today in India and the world, the arts are about the only form, and I mean the arts in the largest sense, which can actually reach out against the walls of prejudice and walls of hatred and walls of exclusion that we have built. And to not use that language, to me, is giving up on being a citizen, giving up on being a part of a human race that desperately needs a change of course. And I just feel very sad about it. There was a time we heard these stories, and I'm sure in dance, and I know a little bit about the music end of the business, when people took years in perfecting their art form. I can understand that in, uh, in pop culture, the quicker you are to the market, the better it is. Is there a danger that classical is as well as getting to that point where it's a question of quick fame? There aren't shortcuts to using language. As Geetanjali was saying just now, she has the permission to use it into quotes incorrectly because she knows how to do it correctly. And this is something that I learned from my mother very much, that you had to, you had to have the art form in your DNA before you start change. So if somebody challenges me and says, do a Pandanalur Margam, I can get up just now and do it. And it's because I have the grammar and I practice the grammar every day that I give myself the permission to wrangle with the grammar and the content, not otherwise. Uh, you said something to me on the podcast that completely cracked me up. You had a variation of Bharatanatyam. You know, in Gujarat, we are very rightly called a society of business people. And business goes into the arts as well. So there are teachers, and many of them are my students as well, who, depending on what you are willing to pay, the basic seven-year course gets shorter and shorter. <laughs> and in Gujarat, I say that Bharatanatyam has become Taratanatyam. Tarata is Turant in Hindi. So yes, Taratanatyam is very available in Gujarat. And around the world, I have to I say, imagine. including in Madras and Bangalore. I imagine, yes, that's right. Now, the uh, business of, uh, of what's happening in the industry, it's, it's, something, it's something of a corruption. Industry, of Which industry? And the arts and the classical arts. I'm specific about the classical arts and how the classical arts are coming to uh, bear. You mentioned Taratanatyam, for instance. But the standards that people hold themselves to or the standards that the gurus hold their sishyas to has been deprecating a little bit. Now, I understand it's a form of corruption, uh, the way you said it. Again, corruption is something that you railed against from a, from a very early age. Now, you, barely out of your teens, did an IIM from Ahmedabad, and then you got a PhD in organizational behavior. The two are connected. You did the PhD in organizational behavior for a reason. I went to a tiny Montessori school. It was the first Montessori school in India. It's called Shreyas and my paternal aunt ran it. And it was a very protected school in the sense that we were completely unaware that the larger society had a gender bias and a caste bias and an anything bias. Uh, and then I got thrown into St. Xavier's College, 100 students, and all my fellow students seemed to only want to know one thing, which is who do they know who could swing the marks to them? And I didn't understand it. And as I went along, my one question was, why do people get corrupt? And when I was in the IM, David McClelland, who, who is the father of the need for power, need for achievement, need for affiliation, and so on, was a visiting professor. 
And in something that he said about what he was studying in the need for power, I felt an answer could be found of my question of why people get corrupt and who doesn't get corrupt. So my PhD was about that, really. Did you find the answer? I did, indeed. I did. Uh, I did primary research on 900 children from the ages of 11 to 19, because at that time, 11 was still the age of innocence. Not anymore, but at that time. And if you went to 11-year-olds, they genuinely believed that if I'm just now putting in two hours of work and I get a second class, if I put in four hours of work, I will get a first class. By the time they are 15 and facing their board exams, already about 50% have swung away to say, no, that's not how the world works. We need to pull strings. And by the time they are 19, there's only 10% who feel that the process itself is worth it and not only the results. And I tried to find out what was common in this 10%. Was it demography? Was it the medium of education? Was it the kind of school they went to, the kind of family they came from? No. The only thing that was common in the 10% who still felt that the process was worth it and not the result was that in their childhood, they had had one adult, parent, friend, teacher, who had said to them, the world is not a fair place. Don't think that you will get the result you want, but the learning is the fun. Learn, because that is what education is about, not about anything else. And I think that 10% has probably gone down to 1% now. I imagine, yes. Oh. Well, the PhD is consequently Dr. Malika Sarabhai. Indeed. It's for that reason. <laughs> Though I have to say, I have to say something very funny to you as well. Um, IIM wouldn't take me because the head of department, a professor called Pulin Garg, basically didn't like me and said I'd had to go through my first and second years again before the PhD program. I said, I'm not repeating it. I've got very good grades. I went to Harvard Business School and they said that their cutoff age was 29 and I was 20. They said, come back in 10 years. So the only alternative for me was to attach myself to the not so glorious Gujarat University. But as long as I was working with the professors I wanted to, that was fine. I got so excited by my work that I finished my research and writing in 11 months and submitted it. And they said, no, 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 the minimum period is two years. So I had to wait two years. And then they awarded it to me on the 1st of April. <laughs> it figures. <laughs> Consequently, as an extension of that, your one foray into politics. You ran, why did you run? What happened? Are you doing it again? Do we need a prime minister from Gujarat again, sir? No, thank you. <laughs> but you must not disclaim my very strong Dravid heritage. It's I'm true. a genuine let mongrel. Me, yes, yes, let me, let me say that. You are half Gujarati, I, I am half a, Tamran. My Kathya, half my Kathiawadi maternal grandmother's family will say, no, we are not Gujaratis, we are Kathiawadis. Okay. So I'm quarter Kathiawadi, quarter Gujarati, quarter Tamil, quarter Malayali. That's good. I had it at 150%. She's one of us. <laughs> the politics. In 2002, after the pogrom in Gujarat, I felt that people who genuinely wanted to govern the country, to see that the last person got a leg up, needed to get together whatever their political ideology. So I went around the country for the next six or seven years talking at large gatherings to young people, to Rotarians, to women's groups, saying we need to put aside political ideology, commit ourselves to making India a more just and a better place for all the voiceless people, and commit seven years, two years before an election, to working in the area you are going to stand from, in getting a credibility that you are there to actually work and not to just become five times richer in five years, which is what happens all the time. And I said, if, if I can gather together 200 people and they stand, and if even 30 get elected, that will be a huge chunk in parliament, enough to actually make a difference. And I said to people, you will never be re-elected. So this is a seven-year stint because you will not indulge in corruption. You will not indulge in 
adding to your kitty by playing the industrialist's way, you will actually govern and you will govern using all that is available to us, all the schemes that are available to us, and see that the last person gets affected by them. In 2008, 2009, not one person had actually committed. So in 2009, I thought, okay, let me at least try and see if one can even do the electoral process transparently and correctly. And on an off chance, I don't know, maybe, I had asked the Congress not to put a candidate against me. But the Congress itself has so many skeletons in the Gujarat Congress that they did not want me to be there questioning them. So I stood as an independent. And when you stand as an independent from somewhere as important as the Gandhinagar Ahmedabad constituency, all the parties become an old boys club. Mm -hmm. So anything I did, any kind of complaint I made about violation of rules, they would become a club. My violation of rules comment wouldn't be looked at for 15 days. But in those 30 days, it has been the biggest learning curve of my life. I used to leave at six o'clock in the morning and over 30 days, I have met and have notes of the complaints of two lakh people. Two lakh people. I have got a room full of notes saying, Dai Ben from such and such village says that for seven years, they've not had a bridge across the Nalla and therefore the children don't go to school in four months. Now I challenge anybody in this country who has stood for political office to come up with a database like that. And when I lost, I went to my constituents and I said, listen, I've lost, but Mr. Advani, for the first time in 20 years, moved to Gandhinagar for three weeks. At least you got to see who you are electing. <laughs> with, in such a short span, so much, such a packed life, and when you do write your memoir, it's all about your battles with health. And it just doesn't add up. How is it that somebody who can achieve that much in dance, which is a very physically demanding form, can write a memoir? This is not an autobiography. It's a specific memoir about a specific part of your life. And that's what makes it highly compelling. One of the things that I want to say is that this book is a, is a compendium of alternate therapies. And it's fascinating that while somebody in your position had access to every single allopathic therapy in the world, you decided to take it upon yourself with the same zeal that you did everything else to dive into alternate therapies as such. It's all in the book. I'm not going to outline all of that. But you quit smoking in your discovery. You say you were, you don't know, you were hypnotized or you weren't hypnotized. For all those people who are trying to quit smoking right now, hypnosis, does it work? Tell us the story, what happened? I didn't want to get married. I didn't think I wanted children. But I said to myself that if I ever want a child, I'll quit smoking a year before I get pregnant because it wouldn't be fair on the child. I met a man that I thought, I really want to marry this guy. And one year down the line, we wanted a child. But before my wedding, I was in New York and I was with a friend and I said, I want to quit smoking. But every time I quit smoking, I eat so much, I put on weight and I hate being fat. And she said, there's a marvelous Jewish psychologist and he specializes in smoking and weight loss. And it's very difficult to get an appointment, but let me try. So I got an appointment and I went into this gentleman's clinic. And uh, before I even got to him, I was asked to pay $200, which was a lot of money then. And um, one part of me was saying, you're an actress. You're gonna act this out. Nothing's going to make you hypnotized. And I went in and there's this typical Jewish Man, I mean, Woody Allen characters are like that. Sort of bent over and, you know, like this. And he says, um, your friend tells me you're an actress, then this is going to be very easy for you. Uh, so why don't you lie down here? And then he started talking to me about, uh, he count down, count down to five, you're now fast asleep, you listen to what I say. And he started talking to me about how wonderfully filled with oxygen I would feel running up a hill, and I'm lying there saying, I dance. I dance five hours and I'm not breathless. And uh, this is rubbish, you know. And, and then he started talking to me about the horrors of cancer. Imagine the mouth and imagine this and imagine that. And, and I was imagining and still saying to me, Sally, actress, hai kya, yaar? 
And uh, 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later, he says, okay, uh, he empties my bag. There are two packets of Dunhill, which are very, very difficult to find in New York. He jumps on them and smashes them. He gives me his card and he says, this is where I am. I'm in Miami and Los Angeles and here every week. Call me, collect if you ever want to smoke again. So I go out and I say, this is not going to work. And I'm early for a lunch appointment. I'm walking uptown and I'm looking for a place where I can buy British cigarettes. I have never smoked since then, ever. <laughs> and people, people say to me in one 20 minute session, and I say, yes, and I've tried to find another hypnotist, and lots of my friends have tried hypnotists who, who have 30 sessions, 20 sessions, 25 sessions, and they still end up smoking. So I'm not sure whether it was because I really wanted to quit, or it was the marriage of wanting to quit and his hypnosis, non-hypnosis, but it was something. Does it work for weight loss? My book will work for weight loss. I agree. Like it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know, when uh, finally, Towards the more recent time, you write that one morning, after all this, one morning, you woke up to a crippling pain, chikungunya, and you write these words, if I may quote you. Yes. Did 40 plus years of carefully nurtured good health and clean living amount to nothing? And well, that wasn't true. You soldier on. Does nothing get you down? Oh, lots gets me down, but I have lots of loving friends and more importantly, a brood of dogs that I love and who forgive my moods and my swings and my anger and my depression and everything. Of course, things get you down. Everybody gets down. But the point I was trying to share, I am trying to share in the book is that ultimately I have only one body and I have only one self that I call my own. And that is really the only thing you have control over or can try and influence that you can try and make better. So rather than doing anything else, the feeling of good health, the feeling of getting up in the morning and saying, hello day, I'm ready for you, is worth more than anything else, anything, and I promise you anything else. I've had hundreds of awards and I've won lots of things and I've had amazing relationships, but the relationship with my body and my mind is what sets me to do anything that I do. And I beg of all of you to give your bodies that chance to make your bodies your friend, your ally, because that's one thing you can do. Nobody else can do it for you. And that's really what it's about. I can't believe we timed ourselves this wonderfully. <laughs> if uh, in free fall, my experiments with living, it's a wonderful book. As you can see, it inspired me greatly. And I really felt great after reading the book. Malika Sarabai. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what you heard, please share it with family and friends. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible are Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandani Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.